All right, well, let's get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Archaeology Abridged. My name is Ben Thomas, and I'm the AIA's Director of Programs. For those of you joining us for the first time, AIA is North America's oldest and the world's largest archaeological organization with over 200,000 supporting and subscribing members. From its founding in 1879, the AIA has been committed to supporting archaeology and archaeologists, publishing and disseminating the results of archaeological research, and providing programming, like this one, for a variety of audiences. We started Archaeology Abridged in 2020 when the pandemic-related shutdowns and quarantines prevented us from holding in-person events. Archaeology Abridged talks were our way of continuing to provide quality archaeological programming to an audience that was largely homebound. The program proved to be so popular, not just with the homebound, but also with folks who couldn't, for a variety of reasons, physically attend an AIA program, uh, that we decided to keep doing it, even as we are sort of emerging uh, from this pandemic. So this is going to be, uh, uh, as of now at least, a permanent part of our AIA programming. If you aren't familiar with the AIA, uh, again, uh, just to let you know that we are a membership organization. All these programs that we do are supported by our members. Uh, so join us today. Uh, you, can, uh, you can read all about uh, the, the benefits of membership at archaeological.org slash join. Uh, and that way also you will get regular updates and information about all our upcoming programs. Programs like this are also supported by donors and uh, in, including and in addition to our members. So uh, if you're so inclined, you can support our programs by donating to the AIA's annual fund at archaeological.org slash donate. Okay, just a couple of notes. Uh, the lecture is a live presentation. Uh, we are recording it, but we please ask that you do not. Uh, we respect the uh, intellectual property of our presenters and ask that all you, the viewers, do the same. Uh, and we thank you for that cooperation. Uh, this is Archaeology of Bridge. So it's a shorter talk, and then we'll spend the rest of the hour uh, with, for Q&A. So any uh, questions that you have for Tess, please include it in the Q&A box and not in the chat window. There's a lot of uh, uh, a lot of comment, there's a lot of sort of conversation in the chat window and your questions could get lost. So put the questions in the Q&A and we will get to as many as we can get to uh, at the end of Tessa's presentation. Well, I'm thrilled to have Tess Davis here today with us. Tess is a lawyer and an archeologist by training. She's currently the executive director of the Antiquities Coalition. Uh, and she oversees the organization's work to fight cultural racketeering worldwide, as well as its award-winning think tank in Washington. She has been a legal consultant for the U.S. and foreign governments and works with both the art world and law enforcement to keep looted antiquities off the market. She writes and speaks widely on these issues, having been published in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, CNN, foreign policy, and some top scholarly journals. And she's been featured in documentaries in both America and Europe. She's admitted to the New York State Bar, teaches cultural heritage law at John Hopkins University, and is a term member of the Council on Foreign Relations. In 2015, the Royal Government of Cambodia knighted Davis for her work to recover the country's plundered treasures, awarding her the rank of commander in the Royal Order of the Sahametri. Uh, Tess, thank you so much uh, mm -hmm. for being here. Tess and I go back a ways uh, to her days as an undergrad at BU and when I was uh, starting my job at the AIA. So Tess, it's great to see you again. Thank you so much for doing this. And for those of you who aren't aware of this, Tess has already given us two lectures the last two nights. She's on this marathon for us and we are very appreciative. Uh, so Tess, I'm gonna turn it over to you. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'll share your presentation. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. It's truly a pleasure to be here, and I appreciate the invitation to speak today about recent scandals involving stolen Asian art on the American art market. Um, for those of you who I've not had the pleasure of meeting, again, my name is Tess Davis. I'm the executive director of the Antiquities Coalition, and we're a not-for-profit organization that's dedicated to combating the illicit trade in art and artifacts while strengthening responsible cultural exchange. And in this mission, we're proud to partner with some of the communities around the world who are most impacted by this crime, with the U.S. and foreign governments, uh, with groups like ASEAN, the G20, and United Nations 
agencies and other not-for-profit organizations, including, of course, um, the Archaeological Institute of America, where I had the pleasure of starting my career in this field, goodness, 21 years ago now, I think. <laughs> but um, yes, thank you to the AIA for using your platform, your great platform, to raise awareness of antiquities, looting, and trafficking through lectures such as this. Because for too long, uh, public policy and, and popular culture has long treated this, this cultural racketeering, as we call it, as a white collar and victimless crime, if it's treated it as a crime at all. Since the Antiquities Coalition was founded by Deborah Lair, a former AIA general trustee, and Peter Herdrick, a former board member and CEO, we've worked to correct this false narrative. Cultural heritage has been looted and stolen by some of the last century's worst villains, by the Nazis, the Khmer Rouge, the IRA, Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and ISIS or Daesh. Slide, please. Speaking of the latter, starting in 2014, media reports reveal Daesh was earning millions by pillaging Mesopotamia and selling its ancient treasures on the black market. By 2015, this had been confirmed by the UN Security Council, and that same year, the US Federal Bureau of Investigation likewise announced it had, quote, credible evidence that these looted antiquities were headed to the United States, the largest art market in the world. The art market's response, at least publicly, was skepticism, if not indignation. One founder of a major dealer's association stringently denied there was any such risk, saying, quote, nobody on the market would touch this stuff with a 10-foot barge pole. The major auction house is also just misconcerned, with Christie saying, we're always on the alert for material of this type in case an attempt is made to introduce looted items into the commercial art market. And we work closely with UNESCO, Interpol, and other entities to inter ensure such attempts are called. James Cuno, president and CEO of the J. Paul Getty Trust, said no responsible museum is buying anything that might possibly come from Iraq or Syria. The overarching message was that due to their own ethical standards and self-regulation, there was no demand for these, quote, so-called blood antiquities. Slide. Or was there? Just months later, in March 2016, the art world gathered in New York for one of its biggest annual events, Asia Week. This 10-day celebration of Asian culture brought together 46 dealers, five auction houses, and over a dozen museums and cultural exhibitions institutions to exhibit, buy, and sell masterpieces from Afghanistan to India to Japan and everywhere in between. But these industry leaders were soon joined by uninvited guests. At the start of festivities, federal agents stormed Asia Week and from then on conducted near daily seizures of looted art. The raids were part of a crackdown on the illicit trade by the Manhattan District Attorney's Office and Homeland Security Investigation, and their work continues. They are actually quite busy, but to date, they have dismantled a number of criminal networks, secured felony convictions for key players, and confiscated hundreds of millions of dollars worth of ancient art, much of which comes from Asia. The fallout prompted warnings that the American market for Asian art is still the wild, wild east of the art world. With all eyes focused on Iraq and Syria, looted masterpieces were flooding New York from Asia, often from current or former hotspots such as Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Cambodia. And these treasures weren't being hawked in back alleys, but they were being sold by the most prestigious individuals and institutions in the art world. This wasn't a new problem. In the 1980s and 1990s, as the art world was desperately trying to prevent future scandals involving classical Near and Middle Eastern antiquities, scholars Neil Brody and Jenny Duell warned that, in contrast, quote, most Asian objects that appear on the market do so seemingly out of thin air, hardly ever accompanied by any details of fine circumstances or previous ownership. Nor did this apparent double standard go away. Years later, in a 2008 op-ed, a prominent New York Times art critic, so we're not even talking an archeologist here, lamented the quote, eager market in the United States for art casualties from Tibet to Cambodia, and pondered how is it that so few questions are asked about just how works of major importance for which no government would ever 
issue an export license come to tumble onto the market? Do the temples of Cambodia erected by the Khmers at the height of their culture between the 10th and 13th century ring so few bells? He concluded that from Tibet to Cambodia, the common treasure of mankind is squandered at a rate that matches the melting of Antarctica and business goes on. Slide. The continuing fallout from the Asia Week raids, and there have been so many seizures since 2016 that at times the authorities have literally run out of space to store recovered material, is hopefully putting consumers, museums, and policymakers on the alert that this is a risk. In recent years, we have learned so much about the transnational criminal networks that supply not only the Asia Week sales, but have been supplying the global black market and the region's ancient art more broadly. And this is a testament to the tireless work of the Manhattan DA and HSI, Homeland Security Investigations, but also the Southern District of New York at the Department of Justice, as well as countless academics, investigative journalists, and advocates around the world. What's been discovered could fill weeks of talks. Again, this is actually the third lecture on a related topic this week. So today I just wanted to provide one case study, the trafficking network of one Douglas Latchford. Slide. On August 31st, 2020, the New York Times carried the headline, Douglas A.J. Latchford, Khmer Antiquities Expert, Dies at 88. This title was an interesting choice for Latchford while a collector and dealer was not a trained art historian, archeologist or scholar. He was instead a business tycoon who claimed to have made his millions in pharmaceuticals and real estate. And he died under felony indictment, fighting extradition to the United States for masterminding an organized trafficking network which had plundered treasures from Cambodian war zones and trafficked them into the world's top collections. It's no exaggeration to say he himself directly linked the Cambodian Civil War, responsible for one of the worst genocides of the 20th century, with the very elites of the art world. If you saw one of my other lectures for the AIA this week, you have heard brief mention of him, but I wanted to use this lecture to zero in because even today in what is a tragically crowded field, to me, no single figure looms as large over one civilization's wholesale pillage. Much of what I've said thus far was a matter of public and indeed legal record when Latchford died. Despite a flurry of obituaries that continued to paint him as a colorful adventurer at the time of his death. However, since that time, so just we're talking a couple of years, investigative journalists, law enforcement, lawyers, concerned citizens, the US and Cambodian governments, and even some of Latchford's former criminal associates have actively worked to further reveal the scope of his crimes. We will likely never know the full story, but we know as much as we know arguably about any antiquities trafficker and what we do is damning. Slide. Let's start at the beginning. An Englishman born in the Raj, Latchford journeyed to Southeast Asia in the 1950s, seeking his fortune, which clearly he found. Settling in Bangkok, like so many, he found newly independent Cambodia and an oasis of peace in war-torn Indochina enjoying a cultural renaissance that was marked by a renewed and rightful pride in the kingdom's rich heritage. Latchford, as so many are, was drawn to this ancient past. Indeed, he later told the New York Times he believed himself to be the reincarnation of one of the Khmer Empire's most famed kings. Latchford became a familiar sight at the country's ruins, which were then so abundant in statuary that early French archaeologists had described them as open-air museums. Yet slowly, these stone, gold, and bronze gods, which had guarded their temples for centuries, in some cases a millennium, began to disappear. By the late 1960s, within expat circles at least, in Southeast Asia, Latchford was known as Dynamite Doug. Sources have told me he earned this name by using explosives or, and this is an important qualification, at least telling his drinking companions that he did so, who knows if this is true or not, to do in seconds what archaeologists could only accomplish in years. Now, if the story stopped there, if there had never been the war, Latchford would probably be remembered as another colonial rogue born in the wrong era. But the war did come. In 1970, Cambodia, which many thought would permanently escape the ravages being suffered by Vietnam, ended up erupting in a conflict as brutal as any in the 20th century. Fighting would not stop until the late 1990s. And in those intervening years, 
actually during four years within that time period, a quarter of the population would lose their lives in what have since been called the killing fields. These attacks against the Cambodian people went hand in hand with attacks against their rich cultural heritage. From 1970 onward, and this is confirmed by villager testimony as well as other evidence that's being put together now, masterpiece after masterpiece disappear from Cambodia's war zones, many if not resurfacing in the hands of one man, Latchford. These looted treasures cross jungles and mountains, firing lines and a national border including what was then the most, or at least one of the most heavily mined areas in the world, and a disproportionate number, at least of what experts have been able to trace, came from territory that fell to the communist very, very early on. Now, I should add a caveat that the Khmer Rouge's relationship with cultural heritage was complicated and it shifted as they themselves shifted from guerrilla forces to a rogue state back to guerrilla fighters. But we do know from firsthand testimony and documentary evidence alike that when pressed for cash, as war is an expensive business, they turn to crime, including antiquities. And likewise, that even when the party as a whole may have forbid such activities, rogue individuals pursued them for their own financial gain. So these were blood antiquities in every sense of the name. Despite the fact that the conflict at Indochina was of course a major international story at the time, the Western art market needed little encouragement to welcome Latchford's loot and pay handsomely for it. If you've seen Cambodian sculptures in an American museum, odds are you have seen a piece that went through his hands. This is how prolific this network was. According to his criminal indictment, some formerly revered figures were enthusiastic co-conspirators. Others were simply willing to turn a blind eye. Few, though, questioned how museum quality works, especially so many, clearly recently had from temples or pedestals. I've been told that some of these were even coming into collections with dirt and leaves still on them, suddenly surfaced on the market just as Cambodia descended into war. Fewer still actually wanted truthful answers. Latchford provided his purchasers good and faith, good and bad faith alike with plausible deniability. He laundered the products of his crimes by self-publishing them in three massive volumes, which the head of UNESCO Phnom Penh would later call the inventory of the missing patrimony of Cambodia. And in these glossy pages, he disguised the illegal origins of these pieces with false finds box and ownership histories. And we now know he actually had stonemasons physically modify some works um, so they cannot be linked to pre-war photographs. So the historical record too was one of his many casualties. Slide. So how did this, which was long an open secret, whispered in the hotel bars of Southeast Asia come to light? Well, it started with what at first seemed to be an unrelated court case as the Southern District of New York, so that's the federal jurisdiction in Manhattan, sought to recover and repatriate a thousand year old Khmer masterpiece to Cambodia after it appeared on the auction block for $3 million at Sotheby's. And the investigation into that piece, um, by both the DOJ and HSI, first put Latchford on the radar of US law enforcement and the Asia Week raids with which I began this lecture then provided much additional evidence. All of this and more eventually led to a federal felony indictment against him in 2019. And I should say that despite very active law enforcement in the United States on against the illicit antiquities trade, um, criminal charges like this, especially against traffickers, are, are actually quite rare. This was a very big deal when this happened. His 2020 death extinguished these criminal charges against him, but they did not. It did not end U.S. efforts to pursue his collections recovery, or U.S. efforts to pursue his co-conspirators around the globe. Both of these are still ongoing. At the same time, the royal government of Cambodia was also spearheading an unprecedented effort bringing together archaeologists, attorneys, and government officials to find, recover, and bring home their looted masterpiece. And this team, joined by international partners like American attorney Brad Gordon, are enjoying well-deserved and historic successes. In January of 2021, so just months after Latchford's death, Cambodia announced that his daughter and heir would be returning his personal collection. This was 125 pieces worth an estimated $50 million, including some of the most important pieces in the Khmer Canon. And 
the Cambodian government publicly thanked the United States and our law enforcement for their help in finalizing these negotiations and the eventual agreement. To my knowledge, this is the largest single recovery of stolen art since the end of the Second World War. But this wasn't the end of the story either. Slide. On October 20, sorry, October 3rd, 2021, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists, you may have heard about them before because they broke the Panama Papers story, and last year published the Pandora Papers, nearly 12 million leaked documents published that laid bare the hidden assets, tax avoidance, and financial crimes of some of the world's richest and most powerful people. These included Douglas Latchford in a front page above the fold story on the Washington Post, exposing how, in addition to his trafficking network, he had also hid millions of dollars in profits through the misuse of offshore accounts, tax havens, and trust. You may have seen this coverage because in addition to the Washington Post, it also made headlines on multiple continents, including the BBC, The Guardian, Germany, Australia, and France, um, Le Monde in France, and others. And its further unmasking of Lashford has been having a concrete impact to their credit. Following the coverage, the Denver Art Museum has agreed to return four statues linked to him. Um, and pressure is increasing on other institutions, especially the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which is home to dozens of pieces with Latchford ties. Slide. Nor have these US investigations stopped. As you see from this list here, the DA's office, Southern District and HSI remain dedicated. And with each of the announcements listed on this slide, they have made clear in a specific quote in each press release that their criminal investigation is ongoing. So stay tuned, there will be more on this issue. So what lessons can we take away from this? Um, first, while I frequently do refer to Latchford as a one man supply and demand, he also had a lot of help, not only from archeologists, art historians, conservators, shippers, um, to, to run a trafficking network of this size involves the complicity of many, many experts around the world. Um, this is true whether we're talking about Latchford or other traffickers. Second, um, it's ironic that the organized plunder of Cambodia began in 1970. That's the very year of the main international law that is meant to combat the illicit trade. And for that reason, 1970 has become a bright line by which most of our museums in the West, that they promise to not acquire antiquities that were not on the market before that date. We again know that by and large, most of the looted antiquities from Cambodia entered the market after 1970. And so regardless of what the actual law is, by museum ethical standards and guidelines, these should not be in public institutions. Um, but third and most distressing, this industrial trade began with the Civil War and arguably with Latchford, but it did not end with him or with peace. It continued along the same route, sometimes by the same men or their descendants. Trafficking networks, any criminal network once in place, are very hard to eradicate. But um, slide, I don't want to end on that dark note, but with a message of hope. Um, again, a generation ago, Cambodia was the global hotspot. And the success they have had in bringing home their plundered past was completely inconceivable then. Um, we work with communities around the world who are unfortunately living through the tragedy Cambodia suffered in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, that they're living through it today. And I can say that I have been told many a time that Cambodia's story gives them great hope that they too will be able to recover the cultural property being stolen from them. This is true of places, whether we're talking about Ukraine, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, or Ethiopia. So while a serious topic, a dark story, I don't think it's a hopeless one and that Cambodia's case um, should be an inspiring example for us all. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Tess. That, uh, you know, and you pointed this out yesterday as well. It is all these emotions rolled into one. It's fascinating, it's depressing, it's hopeful, uh, but it's fantastic to see the kind of work that uh, folks like you are doing uh, in this case. Um, to the 
to the participants, uh, feel free to enter your questions in the Q&A box. And while you're doing that, uh, Tess, let me ask you a couple things. So the first question is just about this legal process. Latchford's name comes, uh, you know, gets on the radar because there's a case that's being brought uh, by the federal government. Um, what is that legal process? Who brings the complaint? What happens? How does that unfold? Yes, so again, the result, so the eventual indictment against Latchford was a long time coming. Again, going from a case that started in 2012 with um, the charges coming in 2019. Um, these are very difficult, complicated cases to bring. They involve not only complex issues of American law, they also involve complex issues of foreign law. And despite the successes that we see and the press and statements from the occasional museum director worried that all the museums are going to be empty. The, the legal standards are quite high. It's, it's very, very difficult to bring even a repatriation case, let alone criminal charges. Um, what I think has distinguished recent years is, the, is that the US government is trying to approach this criminally. Um, for years and years, a lot of these were civil forfeiture cases, um, basically seeking to find an illegal piece on the market, recover it, return it to its country of origin. That's important to do, of course, but it's been found that that does not have the deterrent effect that one would hope, that trafficking networks were even including the cost of losing some pieces to law enforcement and to the cost of doing business. What's really needed are criminal choices, uh, criminal charges against those who are who are knowingly doing this. Again, not the good faith purchasers, nothing like this, but the, the Latchfords of the world. Um, so the indictment was a very big deal. Um, it's very unfortunate that he never faced justice in a court of law. They did try to extradite him, but at that time, again, he died at 88. He was in Thailand. It's a, it was a quite difficult situation. But um, at least he died under indictment um, and that this is his legacy, um, not the legacy of the art expert and, um, you know, donor. So, so we, I cannot commend the work of Southern District of the Manhattan DAs and HSI enough. They have very few individuals working on this, but they are arguably pursuing more cases than all of the other countries in the world combined. Um, I don't have an exact stat on that, but we follow this pretty closely and I'm comfortable saying that anecdotally. Um, they're really doing incredible work and it's very meaningful work um, to the communities and even the whole countries who have been victimized by this. So just a follow-up question to that. Uh, and someone asked, Raymond Ferrara asked, does the FBI and or ICE employ special arts crime investigators? And what they is do. the background that these investigators bring to the job? It's everyone's dream job, right? Um, so yes, both HSI and the FBI um, have art teams. Um, these are not large in number. And I would say that it happens that HSI handles more of the antiquities cases. The FBI tends to handle more of the fine art forgery cases like that. It, again, it depends on the case and jurisdiction, but that's how, that's why I haven't been mentioning the FBI much, um, despite the amazing work that they're doing in this field. But um, they do have specialized agents because, again, these are hugely complex cases. Um, the law is all, uh, complex. You also need an understanding of the cultural heritage of places you need to know if pieces are real or fake. Um, and these cases are also increasingly um, intersecting with financial crime cases. So money laundering, tax evasion, things like that, which are also very specialized expertise. So um, what has been interesting to see is this partnership between the Manhattan DA's office and HSI, which is unusual because that's state law and, and federal agents. They, they don't always work together, but they have made a very successful team, not just with the Asia Week raids, um, but with other investigations. And I think done a lot to clean up the New York art market, which is protecting the good faith collectors, the good faith dealers, and the good faith museums out there. You know, people don't, the legitimate art market doesn't want to be buying this material. So hopefully is grateful that they're taking it off the market. 
Uh, so, you know, there is obviously we're we're talking about the trafficking and we're talking about sort of the profit moti mo 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 motivation here. Uh, but there was a question about sort of the, the theft uh, by the Russians from the Kherson Museum. But just in general, obviously, there's something beyond the profit motive. So what is why are the Khmer Rouge and Daesh and things? Why are they exploiting antiquities uh, and, and archaeological sites? Well, and, you know, there was actually um, with the Genocide Convention, there was actually an attempt by the drafter, the drafter of the convention, the man who it was his his brainchild felt it hugely important to include cultural destruction and the actual definition of genocide, that if you're going to wipe out a people, you have to wipe out everything that makes them great. Um, you can't have it any other way. And so the two are intricately linked. And so if you look at genocides um, throughout history, cultural, discussion, cultural destruction is a part of them. It's also frequently a warning sign um, of them. So there's a certain power that comes with, with the power to destroy these things that are irreplaceable. And this is what we're seeing in Ukraine today, unfortunately, and what we're seeing in Yemen today, Ethiopia. Um, but, but many, many conflicts, if you go throughout the last hundred years, there's an element of this in there. And the antiquities trade part comes in because war is an expensive business. Um, and you often find armed insurgents or even rogue states or even actual states needing to finance hostilities and they make use of resources within their territory to do that. It doesn't matter whether the resource is timber, whether it's gemstones, whether it's gold or in this case antiquities. Um, so the, the two very much go hand in hand. Um, and so, okay, following up on that, this idea of destruction and genocide, and I've heard variations of this question, and you know, it's in this uh, Q&A as well, uh, given that groups are destroying their antiquities in their, in their homeland, wouldn't transfer of these resources to other countries help to preserve them? Well, this is, um, this is something that we, of course, hear a lot. And interestingly, um, this was also an argument that Latchard himself used, that he was saving this material uh, from the Cameroon. She said that in the press multiple times. Um, now, of course, with particularly with the work that's being done by this Cambodian team on the ground, um, they're learning just how close the links with um, some of the Cameroon were. Um, but we, we've we also heard reports that, that Daesh was using the same the message in, in marketing its material. Um, the answer I have to that is these sites were, you know, say for thousands of years until there was a demand for this material. Um, certainly pieces were harmed um, during the conflict itself in Cambodia, but um, Every expert I have talked to, at least having worked there for 20 years, have said the damage that was caused by the fighting was minuscule compared to just the absolute devastation that took place um, because of the, the black market. Um, sites like Cocaire, from where many of the figures uh, Latchford looted, from which it, they came, I mean, they, they've been, you know, there's only a handful of freestanding statues left at the site, a, a site that again was described as an open air museum. Um, the other thing about that is the parts of the world that are in conflict change. Um, for example, that we've all seen the footage of ISIS destroying um, the wing bulls. Um, in a propaganda video that came out. I wanna say that was around 2012. I might have the year off, but around that time period. Um, and there were many, many op-eds at the time, um, close to encouraging a black market and Iraqi material to protect it. Well, you know, a couple of generations previously, it was, the, it was those statues in London, Berlin and Paris that were under complete threat of annihilation in World War II. Um, and certainly, you know, the AIA being in Boston is well aware of the theft, the heist at the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, one of, at the time, the largest property crime in history, certainly the largest art crime in history. And yet, 
have never heard an argument that a Boston museum should, you know, be sending their material elsewhere for safekeeping. Um, so I think while at the same time appreciating that, you know, we, we want these objects to survive, um, the goal should be to work with the communities to, to protect them, um, not to steal them. Yeah. Uh, so uh, going along with that, so, you know, there's a question about museums purchasing, how do they continue to purchase Asian art when they fully know that much of it's stolen? Don't their boards put pressure on them? So going along with that, could you address that issue and this idea of there is a way to legally acquire objects, correct? Certainly. And, you know, antiquities have been, well, on the one hand, the trade is dwarfing anything that happened in the past. No one denies that antiquities have been traded for millennia. There was a thriving art market in ancient Rome, for example. Um, there is a lot of material that is legally on the market. Um, what is concerning to us is that, again, to use the Asia Week sales as an example, these are the top of the top institutions. We're not talking about back alley dealers. We're not talking about anonymous people on eBay. Um, these are the experts, some institutions that have entire teams of lawyers and um, curators on staff. Yeah. If this much illegal material, we're talking near daily raids, and again, it's a high legal standard they have to meet to get this. They just can't go in there taking what they want. They really do have solid evidence it's stolen if they act. Um, that's concerning because that's that's the height of the art market. So what is showing up on eBay? What is in the back alley dealers? Um, if the height of the art market isn't setting that example, how bad is the rest? And this is something that I think it's important. It's unfortunate that archaeologists and the art market have been sometimes seem at odds over this issue because there is every reason in the world for antiquities collectors, dealers, and auction houses um, to be pushing just as much, if not more, as archaeologists to clean up the art market. Because I think the Asia Week raids show it is very, very dangerous to buy antiquities today. Um, if you can't trust to buy it from a major auction house, if you can't trust it to buy it at a major dealer, clearly you have to do your own homework. Um, you know, this is, is an issue of consumer protection as well. Um, and so hopefully there has been an effort in recent years to add the art market to the United States anti-money laundering protections. Actually, the art market is the remaining industry of its size and risk um, that is not. It's the only one, um, which is why it's frequently referred to as the largest unregulated market in the world. And while no one likes more regulation. I say this as a nonprofit executive director. You know, as someone that is at a nonprofit, we have a lot of paperwork. It's hard. Um, but at the same time, while not geared toward trafficking, the, the protections that laws like that would put in place, I do think would also help protect the good faith collectors, dealers, and buyers. Um, we are very grateful to Jim Clark, the Netscape founder. You may have seen his name mentioned on a, um, a slide. This is the billionaire who founded Netscape. And um, it turned out that he had bought or, you know, around $30 million worth of art from Latchford that he had in his personal collection. And to his credit, um, gave it back as soon as he was presented with evidence of its theft and made very strong statements saying, listen, I get why it's difficult for people to, to give this stuff back when you've paid good money for it, but why would you want to own it? Um, and he really spoke out publicly about the dangers of buying this stuff, that he should have paid closer attention to where it came from. And I think messages like that are, are very important. Um, certainly there is a legitimate market, but the fact that it is so difficult to tell what is the legitimate and what is the black market, it's a threat to our world heritage and it's a threat to the good faith actors as well. Yeah. And it's interesting. So just as a, a comment, because, you know, this idea that you were saying that people need to speak out, because there was someone on the chat at last night's uh, event, who said that she was a lawyer, and had never heard of this sort of uh, the issues with antiquity trading and the legal aspects. So kudos to you. And, you know, folks like you who are making this uh, more, uh, more audible, more visible, so that people are able to pay attention to this. 
Yeah, and it is difficult. And, um, you know, we're occasionally contacted by a family member who's inherited something. Yeah. Um, that's frequently used as a, a fake provenance. You know, this was found in my grandmother's attic, but it's also frequently real as well. Um, so it, it is very difficult. And there there does need to be a solution, you know, to what are what has been called um, these orphan objects that are on the market without a history. What do you do with them? Um, it's an important question, but at the same time, um, the fact that that question is out there and needs answering um, does not excuse our leading cultural institutions from still continuing to buy this material today. I mean, the, the Metropolitan Museum of New York, uh, in addition to having these dozens of latch for tied pieces, you know, several years ago now, um, well, actually just this year had several Egyptian antiquities seized from them were several million dollars. Um, this followed the infamous gold coffin, um, which you may have seen. It appeared on John Oliver and uh, frequently in the press at the time because of a viral photo with Kim Kardashian next to it. You know, th this was a purchase in, in 2014. Yeah. Um, what our cultural institutions need to be setting the standard. Um, and again, one or two slips of course, but when this is something that you're showing up in the, the newspaper or the court docket on a, sometimes it sees quarterly, if not monthly basis for another illicit purchase, something's not working. Um, either the ethical codes are not what they need to be or they're not being enforced. Um, and I think there needs to be a real effort to find out what that is, what, what is the reason. Okay, so keeping, I'm going to give you a two-parter here. <laughs> so if Latchford's daughter had not voluntarily donated her father's private collection, would legal work have continued to take the collection out of her or any others inheriting his estate? So that's that question. But also then just, I'm going to link this other question to that. Millions of dollars, uh, any chance that Cambodia gets any of those profits? So. Ooh, that's both very good questions. Um, for to the first question, the, the status of the collection. Um, Lashford's death extinguished the criminal charges against him, but it did not magically change the status of his stolen property from stolen to legal. Right. Um, this is especially true in uh, countries like the United States or the United Kingdom, which actually the bulk of his collection was in the UK and not Thailand, where he lived primarily. Um, and in common law countries like, like those two, there is a maxim that a thief can never transfer a good title. Now, of course, there are ways to get around this with statutes of limitations and things like this. It can often seem like a legal fiction, but his death did not make the property legal. It was stolen property. Um, um, U.S. law enforcement and prosecutors were, were very clear um, and have been very clear since that its recovery was a priority. Now that said, there were difficulties. Again, it was in the United Kingdom. Um, Latchford himself was in Thailand. Um, those of you, it, most people don't realize, even most lawyers don't realize how, how difficult it actually is to have these cross-jurisdictional investigations. In fact, you know, sometimes just for a an investigator to call his counterpart in a foreign country, that they'll have to go, you know, they'll have to file papers and get permission from the foreign ministry. You know, I mean, it can take months just to talk to somebody. Whereas criminals, of course, over the border can, you know, talk to each other quite freely. So whether they would have been successful, I think that's an open question. But um, certainly U.S. authorities made it very clear they considered it stolen property. Uh, they were working with Scotland Yard on this actively. And I think it also would have been very, very difficult to, to sell that material given um, the information that had come out. Um, so sorry, refresh me about the second part. Uh, you know, the, the, the million oh, the money. dollars. Yes. Does Cambodia yeah. get anything out of this? Um, but to my knowledge, uh, investigations into the proceeds are continuing. Um, I do encourage the intersection of antiquities trafficking with financial crimes is just is one that's really just starting to be discussed. Um, but there's a lot of interesting material there. And if um, I encourage anyone who's interested in this to go to the website of the ICIJ, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists. Again, they broke the Pandora paper story. They broke the Panama paper story before this. 
And they have a dedicated team that is really looking at corruption in the art world. And to read the coverage that they've done on this, you can go to their website, type in Latchford, or even type in art, and it pulls up uh, the full articles without a paywall. So even if they have a paywall at the Washington Post, you can read them there. Um, because it's, it's challenging um, for me, who's not a math person, to get my head around. But it's, it's really fascinating, the, the money, the hiding of this money, the movement of the millions. Um, and I think this is an avenue we're going to see both claimants and law enforcement really start pursuing more in recent years. I think there's a much more, much growing awareness um, that if you're trafficking antiquities, you're also laundering money. You have to disguise the proceeds somehow. Yeah. You're probably ev evading taxes. Um, and, and so I've certainly just from personal conversations with law enforcement um, this seems to be something they're going to be prioritizing in the years to come. And perhaps surprisingly, some of those cases, I think, are actually easier to prove than the antiquities trafficking cases, which um, which may make them easier to go after the quote unquote bad guys. Yeah. So, I mean, you've made, you've made it very clear that this is not, I mean, this is not a one person show. This is a huge group of people involved in this. So you mentioned that, and there's a question here, that Latchford's co-conspirators included archaeologists, art historians, conservators. What motivations did these accomplices have, especially if they were academics? Was it all financial gain? Is there something else that they're looking for? I, I think it's a mix, just from the ones um, that, that we know about. Um, some, I, I think it was personal relationships. Some, I think it was financial gain. Um, and this is, you know, this is stories we've seen before in other scandals of archaeologists who have gotten caught up in these probes um, when they need money authenticating pieces or whatnot. So I think it does vary um, from person to person. Um, with some industries, I think there might be a lack of awareness that's starting to change now that this is becoming more front page news. But um, for example, I know that federal law enforcement, um, you know, they do a lot of outreach now to FedEx because we're seeing a lot of pieces shipping through FedEx and not through cargo uh, or with passengers um, just to educate them about what red flags to be looking for and things like that. But when you think of something from start to finish, again, you know, these, these pieces were often shipped in parts because it was easier to move them that way. So you had to have someone someone very skilled to put them back together. Then they had to be authenticated. They had to be appraised. They had to be photographed to put in these glossy books. Um, so it, it was a, a lot of individuals involved. Nancy Weiner, who um, was targeted in the Asia Week raid, she was a second is a second generation dealer. Her mother, Doris Weiner, was. Um, actually arguably that generation's top dealer of, of Asian art, um, you know, dealt with the Rockefellers and the Kennedys. I mean, just thought we're talking the very heights of the art world. Um, and Nancy was, um, you know, pled guilty to, to charges coming out of the Asia Week raids and described it as a conspiracy of the willing, yeah. which I think, um, is a very accurate phrase and she you know and her plea said you know i knew what i was doing was wrong now I, I do think there's a difference between someone like that um who's dealing with these pieces on the market and then someone like latchford who's actively working with um in some cases very dangerous people to to source them directly from the sites but you know one made the other possible um, again, Latchford was, you know, he was able to, it eventually caught up with him, but he was able to ev evade this fate for decades, um, because people wanted to buy what he was selling and people wanted to, to believe what he was saying, yeah. um, despite some obvious holes in the story. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm going to... There's a number of questions there, and uh, uh, that all relate to specific areas. How can I, you know, find out more about uh, antiquities trading in China, in Peru, in North America? So, is that what was a good? If people want to get involved, if people want to find out more, what should they do? 
Well, very much encourage you to go to our website, the Antiquities Coalition. We're very active on social media as well. And there's a lot of material there as well as interactive resources. Um, a top 10 missing campaign, um, actually one of which was actually, we had our first success with that, a recovery um, this year of a Cambodian piece that was part of Latchford's collection. Um, and um, again, other interactive resources and just resources across the board. Um, if you're looking for more scholarly material, I would recommend the University of Glasgow's project called Trafficking Culture. Um, so if you Google trafficking culture, it should come up. They have an extensive encyclopedia there of cases, um, papers by the team there, which was is an interdisciplinary team of criminologists, archaeologists, lawyers um, who are working to study the illicit trade. So it's a huge source of more scholarly information. Um, and of course, um, I haven't looked at the AIA program, but at archaeological events, we're seeing this issue figure more prominently. Um, and again, I very much do encourage everyone to look at the ICIJ's work on this topic. Um, they have focused on Latchford, but it's gone, it's going much broader than that now, um, because it's a real deep dive of an investigation. Um, that really shows just how complex these crimes are and how difficult it is to combat them. Yeah. Um, the so you said that the attitudes, especially among museums and in art institutions like this, are starting to change. Uh, but what is the sort of the the biggest, I guess, excuse uh, given for not returning objects or uh, for keeping collections that were, you know, taken before the laws were in place? And uh... well, I think everyone is um, worried about, as we say in the law, the slippery slope, um, which I think is also a bit of a unintentional admission of how much the collections are stolen. If you're worried yeah. about that, but. Um, Certainly, I, I think few, if any, are advocating for everything to go back. That said, um, if only because we have to prioritize and, you know, you have to have a strategy, right? I mean, I think the most important thing, again, is to, to stop these acquisitions today. Um, it's hugely disturbing that major museums in the United States are continuing to purchase pieces that end up to be not looted, and we're not even talking looted in colonial times. I mean, we're looted during recent conflicts like the Egyptian Revolution. Right. I mean, that's just unacceptable. And I think um, that museums need to redefine what their mission is and whether that mission needs to be outright ownership, You know, whether they can pursue their goals without actually owning um, these things. Um, one thing that I think has been encouraging to see, um, I mean, there are certainly some museums that are doing incredible work in this area. Uh, the Smithsonian, um, the former Freer Sackler, uh, named former Freer Sackler in particular, the, I think it's now the National Museum of Asian Art. Um, and, the, and speaking of the AIA, uh, around the corner from you, the MFA Fine Arts Boston, I would say, are definitely the gold standards and institutions that are now going through their collections and, and being quite honest about what they're finding there. Um, the other thing is that, you know, these repatriations, and we've seen this with Cambodia, um, museums often treat them as a challenge. Um, mm -hmm but they can be a huge opportunity as well. Cambodia has been able to build some incredibly strong relationships with American museums. It started with the identification of a stolen piece in their collection. And um, you might have a repatriation to Cambodia and then Cambodia will send you know, an unprecedented loan. Um, one of my favorite anecdotes is the Cleveland Museum of Art. They had a giant hand, I believe it was of a Krishna, that they had bought on the market, thinking it fit to a piece in their collection. They tried it, it didn't fit. And then they're like, ah, we actually think it's, if it's a piece in your collection, Cambodia. They shipped it off to Phnom Penh. Phnom Penh digitally scanned it. And was like, actually no Cleveland, it fits your collection. <laughs> and so they, they repatriated it. And this was actually the headline, Cambodia repatriates Krishna statue or Krishna hand to Cleveland Museum of Art. And the um, the head of the museum at the time said, we wanted the piece to be whole, and we think it can be an ambassador for Cambodia there. So 
What I, I think there's a lot of opportunities like that if mu museums rethink this need to own yeah. heritage, um, which in many ways is completely in contrast to our concept of world heritage, right? That belongs to everybody, this need right. for a single institution to own it. And hopefully more museums, as we're seeing with Smithsonian, with the MFA, will use their platform to educate the public that comes through their doors. I mean, because there is a concern that people, again, go into these museums, they see museums acquiring this piece, they think it's okay, they go home and they buy it on eBay. Yeah. I mean, this happens. Um, there is a shocking amount of material on eBay, much of it's fake, much of it's real. Um, so have exhibits about looting. Um, you know. Douglas Latchford would make a fascinating exhibit that I think would really interest the public. Yeah. And I hope we see some things like that because I think museums, if they get creative, um, can really find opportunities in this to do more outreach to the public and further fulfill their own missions. So I think we're almost out of time, but one uh, a more personal question, you know, how do how does how did you get involved specifically with Cambodia? I actually drew Cambodia out of a hat. Um, <laughs> I had a middle school project um, that we had to devote to a country. I really wanted to do Ireland. You can't tell from my coloring, I'm of Irish descent, but um, our teacher forced us to draw countries out of a hat and I drew Cambodia. And actually the war was still going on at that point. I never thought I'd be able to go. Um, I was at BU as an undergrad and was supposed to go on a dig with Professor Paul Zemansky to, um, to Turkey when the Iraq war broke out and um, he apologized profusely and I had to find uh, another position and he said you know what interested you in archaeology in the first place maybe we can find something there and I said Cambodia and what is um, I don't say this lightly it's actually very tragic he said Cambodia I think that's quite dangerous what about Syria I think you'd be much safer there which again shows you just how how quickly these things can yeah. change um, but so very grateful to him, very grateful to Miriam Stark, who took me as a wee undergrad on her survey project there. Um, and certainly very grateful to all the Cambodian co colleagues I've had the opportunity to learn from over the last 20 years, so. Final question. How does one address a, a Cambodian knight? <laughs> the official title is commander, but um, that does sound like something out of Star Trek, I suppose. But um, but no, um, Cambodia has been very gracious with um, with these honors. There, uh, they bestowed them on um, a number of the law enforcement agents as well. Um, and again, this has been um, what I think has been great to see as someone who lived in Cambodia for years and and still works there how much this issue has united our government with the Cambodian government. Um, there are a lot of issues with um, on which our governments do not disagree. Uh, we do not have the strongest relationship, but this has been a bright spot and our governments are working very well together. And when you're talking about things like, I think it shows the power of culture um, to bring people together in a common mission. And when you're talking about these things and working together on these things, then it, it leads to the possibility of other and bigger things happening. So this is a big bright spot. Um, you may have seen that President Biden was actually just in Cambodia and Prime Minister Hun Sen thanked him publicly for the return of these statues. It actually made it to that highest of level that it was and, and the thanks to him. So. Um, it's a bright spot between our countries, and I think so much is coming out of that partnership. It's an honor to be a part of it. Tess, thank you so much. This was fantastic. Um, for all of you who are uh, here, if you want to see this talk again, we will have it on our YouTube channel. If you want to see, if you missed uh, Tess's talks from uh, yesterday and the day before. If you want to see that, that will also be on our YouTube channel. Everybody who's registered, we'll send you a follow-up email with a link. Uh, and uh, so, so you'll be able to kind of get a little bit more of tests uh, after this particular event. Um, again, I encourage you to stay connected with the AIA, become a member, support our programs. We'll keep you informed. Every time we do programs like this, you will get uh, a notification and you'll be able to join us. 
Uh, Tessa's lecture and this archaeology bridge is part of a larger virtual lecture series. This actually is wrapping up our fall uh, session, but we'll be back again in January with um, with Karakuni uh, and talking about uh, The Good Kings, her book about the, the pharaohs of Egypt. So uh, stay tuned for that. And again, be get connected to the AIA and we'll send you regular updates on all this and uh, all this and all the other events that we do. So um, thank you everyone for coming out and Tess, thank you once again, a marathon, three straight days of talking to us about this, uh, but so much more to discuss. So hopefully we'll get you back at some point and do a follow-up to this particular talk, but thank you and, so much. And look forward to seeing everyone in New Orleans, I hope so. Yes. All right. Bye everybody. Thank you.